this week on Political Paradigm, we touch base with civil society to get more insights into the trending national stories in the country and the impact all these happenings have on the most important sector of the society, the citizens. Hello and welcome to Political Paradigm on Channels Television. I'm Kayla Magua. As we celebrate Democracy Day, we start to navigate the torrid terrain that is Nigeria's political landscape and its impact on national development. Joining us to do that this week is Mr. Hamzat Lawal, an activist and founder of Connected Development, or CODE, as we fondly call them. And using their election monitoring tool, Uzabe, CODE monitored the elections through thousands of volunteer observers, shedding light on both positive efforts and concerns. A native of Kogi State, Mr. Lawal is a political science graduate from the University of Abuja and is a famous Boy Scout leader and champion of the 2012 hashtag Save Bagega campaign, a viral campaign that started off on Twitter when Hamzat first used the hashtag to bring awareness to the lead poisoning incident in Bagega, Zamfara State, where more than 700 children died. The campaign got government to release the sum of $5.3 million, which was over a billion naira. And he birthed follow the money afterwards to ensure government agencies spent the money judiciously. Mr. Hamzat Lawa, welcome to Political Paradigm. Thank you, Mela, for having me. What, what happened afterwards? <laughs> I know it's been a while. Yeah, but it has. It has. Were you able to, were the government agencies able to do as they were expected to with the money and and what happened with with the with the victims afterwards oh yes uh, we ensured that so when the president approved the sum of 9.3 million dollars then we got to understand the difference between approval releases and utilization but with our campaign the money moved from the ministry of finance to three line ministries ministry of environment ministry of health and ministry of mines and solid minerals so the environment ministry went into the community and did environmental remediation, which is cleaning up uh, the contaminated soil and bringing new soil. The Ministry of Health was supposed to provide healthcare intervention, but Doctors Without Border, which is MSA, was on ground, and they provided treatment free of charge after environmental remediation. The Ministry of Mines and Solid Minerals provided that equipment for safer mine mining practices and also educational materials for the miners, which was an intervention to ensure that the environment does not get recontaminated. So yes, they used their money, but it's only that of health who could not account how they used over 200 million that was allocated to them. But today, over 1,500 children were treated for free. And the last time I was there was in 2014. They could not even remember that, you know, I was the guy who came to ensure that the environment was clean and then they got safer mining practices and also uh, good health care in the community. So you have state-of-the-art primary health care now in the community. And yes, there's still mining activity, but it's unregulated. Uh, mining activities deep into the forest. Uh, sadly, also with uh, you know the banditry in the northwest, a lot of these miners have also migrated because I saw them in Nanja State. So mind you, in 2016, we did similar campaign in Nanja, but this was Shikira community. And that was, uh, I mean, uh, Jay Mohammed was the Minister of Environment. At that time, we advocated and got over 200 million released, which she also used for remediation and children, over 300 of them got uh, free treatment again from msf so again uh it's it's also now i i hope that the current minister for solid minerals will take that initiative because mining activities is happening but it's happening be, uh, you know in pockets and he needs to come up with an artisanal mining program for local miners you know so that we can formalize them and so they can access loan or credit and we can also train them as government and regulate them and also get tax generated from them. So I, I think there's an opportunity there, uh, you know, to engage. But today, with our campaign and starting to follow the money, government, we've seen government use judiciously the resources that are meant for grassroots communities, not only in Zanfara, but across Nigeria. And now in 12 African countries, by the way. A homegrown initiative that started in Nigeria is now in 12 African countries. And now there's growing interest in the US, in UK, in Canada, because I've been invited by government of these countries. And later next week, I'll be in Lithuania, which is in Europe, to talk about you know, how we're following the money and how we're engaging Cause, government. Because follow the money didn't just stay with the Bagega incident, no, did it? Didn't. You decided to start following the money yes. on constituency projects exactly. and, and yes. things like yes. that. 
but still staying on mining activities. Uh, you know, when it comes to Zamfara State especially, we've seen it cause so much grief yeah. for the people. I want you to be able to get you, because one of the offshoots of it is, is banditry. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, with all of that going on, is anyone checking health implications mm -hmm. at this time? No, not really. So it's really sad that when you look at the, uh, the insecurity aspect of it. So f today I can't even access Bagega community because the last time I spoke to community members, a lot of them have migrated uh, because of insecurity. Uh, sadly, no one is really talking about the health implication. Because, uh, you know, Kayla, I've interviewed grandmothers who in the household, you know, in the northern houses is really big, have lost 10 grandchildren. I've interviewed mothers in local language who have lost four children. Yes, they keep saying it, the children came from God and they've gone back to God. But I think that as, as, I think that as government, as civil society, we must hold ourselves to account. You know, what, how is the action of local miners who are also residing in this community? And I ask the local miners. Why are you mining? You know that you're using lead and it's contaminating water, the soil, for children below three years who their immune system is not strong. And they say, yes, they know. It's killing their children, but they cannot leave it. I say, why? I say, because it's, they're trying to come out of poverty. That with the mining, they're able to feed their wives. They can send their children to school. They can roof their home. They can provide food. So to them, it's about survival and livelihood. And that's why I say there's an opportunity here for artisanal and small-scale mining. But the Ministry of Mines and Soil Minerals must lead this campaign. I know also the organization like the World Bank who can also provide credit or grants, but you must organize and formalize them. Educate and maybe them. even collaborate with the Ministry of Health. Oh, yes. I was going to ask in 24, at the time when the Bagega incident, who was Minister of Health at the time? Uh, I, can't, I can't remember the person's name. Okay. Yeah, but I remember, you know, I went to Ministry of Health, Ministry of Mines and Ministry of Health. He was the same minister that couldn't, well, the ministry couldn't, at, explain yes, what happened date, with the till date of that 200 date. million. Yes, over 200 million. And we documented it. You know, we documented how the Ministry of. I mean, the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Mines and Steel. And, and Environment, yeah. And Environment. They have offices in every state, do oh, they? Oh, yes, not? they do. Oh, they do. They have so offices. Is, so is there any of them in Zafara who's checking to see if, if poisoning is happening? You know, Kela, this is an interesting question. You see, when there was that national emergency that there was lead poisoning outbreak. The news came from mostly international organization that has a base, mm. which was MSF, Doctors Without Border. When I visited the first time in 2012, I went to Bagega community. Maybe to put this into context, it took me 18 hours. So from Guso to Anka, the road was terrible at that time. From Anka to Bagega, there was no road. It was just a pathway. So we, I, I rode on a motorbike. When I got to that community, the community people thought I was a government official because before that time, there was no single presence of any government official who had visited. So it was just MSF who had first-hand knowledge and me as a civil society. And then I was just a young activist, you know, who was still in the University of Abuja, by the way, who visited. So it was our campaign that got government officials to travel, those even in Guso and those in Abuja, to travel and do a first-hand assessment of what was going on. Nigeria's matter can really disappoint you. Oh, yes. But, but we, we have to keep trying. Yes, we would never give you up. You would never give oh, up. Yes. All right. Democracy Day. Uh, everyone has been talking about Nigeria's democracy, even around the world. Yeah. Um, of course, we've seen examples around the world of changes. With every election, something is changing. In India, he couldn't have yeah. the absolute majority. South Africa, he couldn't have that absolute majority. We saw that happen in our own way in 2023, where that absolute yeah. majority that you could win, you don't have that yeah. anymore. We're seeing that happening everywhere around the world. Something is changing mm -hmm. when it comes to democracy. In Nigeria's democracy, what would you say is the future for Nigeria's democracy? Are we going to make it? Oh, yes. I think we've made significant progress. For once, our democracy has not been toppled. So for over 20 years, we've consistently and continue enjoying that freedom that the Constitution guaranteed. We've also seen 
citizens becoming more aware, more informed, and they're excited to engage. And we saw that during the continual voters registration just before the election. We saw also how people came out in mass to cast their ballot. We're seeing people understanding their rights more and more. So I think we've made progress, even if we are not there yet. And mind you, we're still emerging. We're still evolving. We're still a young democracy. We cannot compare ourselves to India or the United States or even South Africa who came out of apartheid. So again, yes, we're not there, but we're making progress. And you see, I always tell people, a lot of people will reference the 2023 general election. Kayla, have we forgotten what happened in 2011? Or what happened in 2015? Hmm? In 2011 and before 2011, Election results are announced even before election happened. I used to be a polling unit agent. You know, I've experienced it on the ground where my polling unit result was being announced on radio. And I'm there as an agent to observe. But today, you cannot do that. We've integrated technology. You know, we're using beavers to check over voting and multiple accreditation, you know? So we're not, yes, people are not happy. They were expecting a different outcome. But then we've made progress. We've made it difficult for politicians to interface or interfere in the role that INEC needs to play. So, Kayla, it's a call for not only celebration as we celebrate June 12, but also reflection. Let's go back to history. Because you see, if we don't learn from where we're coming from, then what would guide us to where we want to go? And that's why I'm big on history. And yes, I studied political science, but my major was politics, public policy, and history. So I think we need to study our history and understand where we're coming from. And when I say study our history, a lot of people are aggrieved. Uh, and this message is for our president, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu. How can you reach out to the aggrieved party? Because you see, Nigeria is a nation, and to be a nation is not easy. So how do you bring about political solution? Because it's not everything you, you take to the judiciary or you take to the National Assembly. Yes, we can argue that, yes, without the National Assembly, this is not a democracy. But you must come up with political solutions. And I'm talking even about, you know, that tension in the Southeast. If people say they're being marginalized, listen to them. Yes, majority always have their way in politics, in, in modern democracy. But minority must have their say and their voice. Listen to their concern. You know, have a dialogue, have an understanding. We need a united front at this very difficult moment in our political and historic journey. Because things are a bit shaky. But I also believe that we must celebrate those little wins. That yes, we, you, know, you can't easily rig elections. Yes, the rule of law is prevailing. Yes, we have stronger institutions and lesser stronger men and women in the corridors of power. But we must consolidate and reach out to people who are aggrieved. So we may have been able to grow in our democracy, but a lot of work needs to be done when it comes to nationhood. Oh yes, a lot. And, and you see, when I say a lot, we also need to look at integration. A lot of young people feel marginalized because my generation always say we're a generation of broken promises. A lot have been promised to us, but nothing has been given to us. I've seen some shift. I've seen some progress where a lot of young people are now getting appointed into government. You know, I, I, I can even relate and I've related with a lot of these people before they're in government and now they're in government. And, and for me, it's also for them to prove themselves because you see, sadly, a lot of young people, there's a lot of burden on us. We must prove ourselves. The other people, nobody say they should prove themselves, you know, and they ask, what do you bring to the table? What do you have to offer? Women also. We cannot have a country that decides what is the role of women in governance, in politics, in public service. Why not allow women lead naturally like they are? Because women are natural leaders. We can have a national assembly that will not accept a bill that allows for integration. Because women are marginalized. Now, people with disability. Yes, we have a very strong personality who is leading the Disability Commission. But we need to do much more. Because you see, when we portray leadership publicly, the faces you see, you don't see young people, you don't see women, you don't see people with disability, you see older men. So the message we're even sending to younger people in primary schools, in secondary schools, is leadership is about old people. And this is wrong. Now, when we travel around the world, Kayla, you see under 50 leading countries, 
you see people communicating as peers. Because you see, leadership is about mobilizing, not only managing resources. It is the old days that you say, you want to manage Nigeria's resources. Times are hard. You need to mobilize resources. And when I talk about resources, it's not just about you know, getting foreign direct investment. It's also about managing people. Because our biggest asset has to be the people. If we don't consolidate and we don't see ourselves as assets. And that's why I say all the people that we must have intergenerational equity and dialogue. A, an older person must see us as partners towards progress. So we can also see them as partners, not to say, wait until your turn. Who decide that? And who allocated you to decide that there is turn by turn Nigeria Limited? Well, a lot of people who believe in turn by turn Nigeria Limited well, that's why we feel are that we are. young people are a bit naive when it comes to politics oh, in Nigeria. Wow. They do feel a little bit like young people seem a little idealistic when it comes to politics. No, I, it, it, that's... I, I agree with you, but it's sad. And that's why we are where we are. You need the young people's ideas, their innovation. You need their numbers. We're, we're in, 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 the country, in the entire world, we're the fastest growing population. And if you look at the margin, in another 10 to 15 years, it is young people that would be the over 80% of our population. So if you don't engage them, when you don't engage them, what you're preparing for is chaos. And that's why President Obasan just say, it will be a ticking time bomb if we don't invest in these young people. And we don't want that for our country. Very interesting that you brought up bills. There is a particular bill that somebody's trying to send to the National Assembly, and it sparked up a conversation about our style of governance in mm. Nigeria. Uh, they're trying to say, look, can we try something parliamentary? Because that, it's basically a parliamentary system mm. that he's trying to um, promulgate, you know, where well, the president is in the isn't the biggest uh, politician in the country. You know, he has to be picked from the parliament. And then there's a prime minister, which is a little different uh, from what we're seeing in many other countries. So um, where you have a two-tier system of governance, mm. where the, you know, the second tier decides how it runs itself, where mm. no more FACA locations. Mm. You know, we're, we're seeing all of these ideas about a different style of democracy, basically, um, lending voice to the concept. And we've heard from our president, Olusha Gombasanjo, talk about this before. Our system isn't working. This, it, we, have, we need a localized style democracy. What, what, do, you, what do you make of these calls? That yeah, I right agree. Now? We need to localize our system or form of government. But let's also be honest about it. You know, people who have tested power would leave power and say, oh, it's not done the right way. I always say, what did you do when it was your turn? Why didn't you lead it at that time? Hmm? Okay, now, you know, we have a lot of Democrats who say they're Democrats, but they don't implement democratic tenets. For me, I would say let's have a national conversation. Because you see, Nigeria Another is, conference? No, no, definitely not another confab. Let's have a dialogue, let's have a conversation. Let's have government even sit down with people and talk. Maybe I would use the new national anthem as an example. A lot of people did not accept it because there was no conversation. The beauty of democracy is allowing people to talk. But if people don't talk, then they act in a violent way. So there was no conversation, there was no dialogue, there was no town hall meeting. You know, there was no that engagement, collecting feedback. What do you think about this? What do you, so that's what we need. You know, interestingly, we think, you know, this is rocket science. Just speak to people. Speak to people at the grassroots. Speak to constituents and communicate this in clear terms. But as you do that, you must be honest. Because what I, what I have seen and learned is a lot of politicians are dishonest. And they think that the people that they govern over, they're not smart. And that's where they get it wrong. And that's why I see people quickly move on in Nigeria because they, ah, we've seen this before, we've had this before. So I think that, yes, we need to localize because I believe in homegrown ideals, homegrown initiative that we can take ownership and be proud of that. Ah, you see how I'm proud, follow the money. I said in Nigeria, now it's in 12 countries. Let's start something that is ours. We don't have to always go and copy. And if we're copying, let's copy the good parts. These other nations have existed for over 200 years. Why are we copying the bad part? And I hear some politicians who say, oh, they didn't just get here, it was a journey. Why can't we take lessons from that journey and implement the good part? Why do we have to take all the baggages? So again, I agree, we need our own kind of initiative because we can't have people call themselves Democrats, but they're not acting on or using democratic tenets or ideals. 
It's interesting, you know, when you talk about follow the money, maybe because I am privy to how long this this has been going on, and and your move towards checking constituency projects, I would never forget that. Yeah. Checking hospitals. They said yeah. they built this hospital, yeah. you will go to the village. Yeah. And it's brought to my mind the conversation that we're having right now, which is about the minimum wage mm. and wastage in governance. Do you are you are you listening to this conversation about the minimum wage? Do you think workers deserve over a hundred thousand, let's say, as minimum wage? Bearing in mind that what the presidency is saying is this amount of money that you're asking for, if we give it, we will jump into a bigger problem because everything will be times 10. You would have a lot of money and not be able to spend it on anything. What do you make of that conversation right now? Kella, as the negotiations continue? I've, I followed this debate, I followed this um, negotiation and conversation. I've also been affected by the strike that happened last week. Kela, let's be fair to workers. Let's be fair to them, you know. Um, the president said, you know, things will get hard and later gets better. But he must lead. What sacrifice is the presidency making? What sacrifice is the National Assembly making and other political appointees? You're saying that, let me pause, let's go back. When Mr. President was being inaugurated, when he took the oath of office. And the first thing he said on podium was, subsidy is gone. Kayla, that was the genesis of where we are now. Let's tell ourselves the truth. Yes, we all agree, even as civil society leaders, that we cannot continue to pay subsidy. But that was where the mistake started from. Because when you say subsidy is gone, now there would be an immediate shock. There would be inflation. Prices would go up. Because in Nigeria, we don't have anything called price control regulation. Now, what the president and his immediate advisors were supposed to do was to come up with a pack that would at least cushion the effect for six to eight months so that people would fit into the new removal of subsidy. Now again, he said, no more parallel FX rate. Fantastic. But then again, that is what has led to the Naira being devalued. And now we have a market that CBN is still struggling with. Kayla, I think that we need to be fair to them. Today, 30,000 Naira, what it used to get you before the removal of subsidy and this OFX crisis, it cannot even get it for you. Public transportation is very expensive. Now they also increase electricity tariff. Haba. Let's be fair to workers because without workers we would not enjoy service delivery in public facilities so i think that first let's be honest you see leadership is hard though. i'm not saying it's easy but the wisdom of a leader is to first acknowledge that they have wronged because that would even allow for people to bring their emotions and say okay let's even trust them that they know what they're doing and they will do the right thing. Because you can't say workers and the Nigerian people should tie their belt. But when you look at budget line, they have fever of spending. Do you know? A fever of spending. When you look at how politicians move, and you wonder, ah, ah, is it the same petrol station we're buying for or from? Well, you see, Hamza, that's the thing. They're not breaking the law. What, what, I'm, I'm beginning to realize that we are appealing to the conscience of people as opposed to enacting laws that compel them to do the right thing. If the man is buying five new cars, in fact, we saw from the papers recently, mm, the governor. state mm. governors buying mm. cars for mm. their legislation. He's not breaking the law, is mm. he? Is he breaking the law? Mm. No, sadly. So since he's not breaking the law, what kind of compelling argument are you going to give to this man? You're going to prick his conscience? Killer, I think. Why not we focus on changing mm. the way the spending is done legally? That way we can hold him and say, no, you were not supposed to spend this. So you see, we run a federal system of government where local government have their budget, 
states have their budget and we have the national assembly or the national budget rather a lot of people don't focus on the local and the state i'm sure a lot of people even watching us now they've never seen a local government budget but we always get it and we analyze over 700 of them kayla i agree with you we need to have stronger legal and regulatory framework but most importantly stronger institution that enforces you know these laws and have you know, men that are not strong and do not think that they are above the law or the, the, the rule of law do not abide by them. But I think also, we also need to bring forward principles of governance. So, so I, I, people, you know, everybody has their own individual principle, you know, and, and as a leader, you must deal, you must, you must have emotional intelligence. You cannot have your people suffer and you live like a king. So what kind of leader are you? Because posterity will judge you. So yes, we would appeal to conscience, but as we also grow in our democracy, I hope citizens actually become more awoken. Whenever we, I, I hear people say posterity will judge somebody in Nigeria, it makes me laugh. How many people has posterity judged in Nigeria? In fact, what we have seen is that the more corrupt you are, and the richer you are, the more people fear you and revere you in Nigeria. I have, I am, I'm yet to see that person that was punished by posterity in Nigeria for being corrupt and wasteful and for not caring and living like a king while his people lived like paupers. I'm yet to see that person. Or, or maybe you could tell me one. Kela, because of our value system. And that's why we need a value reorientation. We need a mindset shift that we cannot continue like this. If not, each and every one of us will go on our news. Businesses will shut down. Government will crumble. And then we will lead to anarchy. But we must be fair to these workers as we negotiate. I also want to appeal to the labor union. You know, let's, you know, let's come to some understanding. Let's all negotiators, let's meet, you know, let's meet at the middle. You yes, know? the middle of 600 Let's, that they brought before. You know, Kela. <laughs> the middle of 600 Kela, is 300. You, you, know, you know, the first thing eh, is to deal with inflation. Because even if you get 600, inflation would eat it. Price control. How can we also bring down this electricity tariff? So what eats our money every month? Public transport. Energy consumption. Healthcare utility. Paying out of pocket education so why can't we have okay i've traveled i don't travel small i've traveled around the world mm -hmm. there are options if you if you earn well you can take a taxi you can take a yellow cab in new york mm -hmm. you pay hundred dollar mm -hmm. but there's subways mm -hmm. three dollars why can't we have an effective public transport system you know have public buses where people can pay little and still go from one point to another hmm? Now, why don't we have a health insurance that covers for people where they don't have to pay from out of pocket? And let's go to education. And, and sadly, with all of this, a lot of children are still dropping out of school. Even people that are middle income earners cannot send all their children to school. So we need to first deal with inflation. Because even if government say they will pay one million a power worker, inflation will eat that money and price control. And you see, this has to also do with the conscience of people or the value of people. They see an opportunity where they would make more income rather than even considering, can people afford this? Because you see prices in Nigeria can always go up, but it hardly comes down, mm -hmm. even when government intervenes. So I think government needs to come hard on people who are milking other citizens and gaining from all of this crisis. I believe that if government come clean, and are very honest and open. But as they come clean and honest and open, they must also tell the Nigerian people what are they sacrificing? Because you can't leave large and say other people should tighten their belt. What excesses can the government cut down on, in your view, at well, least from civil society? There are many excesses, Kayla. You know, we, we can't be talking about uh, hospitals not functioning. And then you're commissioning billions of Naira buildings for public officials. You can't say that, um, you know, you've removed subsidy, but you see convoy of motorcades. So again, you must lead by example and lead from the front.
Because you see, leadership starts from the top. If Mr. President, yes, I know that yes, his acts, uh, you know, his, his appointees that you need approval to travel and they have to cut down how many delegates would have to travel so, for some of these bilateral meetings. But we must also see that a budget is presented where the budget line is justifiable. Not having a budget line and you don't even know where these monies are going to or what MDA. And in any case, when there's an MDA, and then you wonder why is this MDA carrying this budget line? And when you release money, then you also tell the Nigerian people what this money would be used for so that we can continue to follow the money. But most importantly, we can show Nigerian people value for money. Because Nigerian people are getting tired of all the trillions. Because now we're talking trillions. It used mm. to be billions, but now it's trillions. But people at the grassroots are not feeling it. So it's just as if we're living in a bubble in Abuja, Lagos, Port Harcourt. Mm. And we think, you know, everything is well. No, it's not. I just came back from Brunei State. Mm. And I was in Guza. Yeah. When you, when you follow the money, because I know you still follow the money. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. What are the trends you're seeing right now? Hmm, interesting. So it's, ex it's exciting to see that Hadiza Bala Usman, who is the uh, policy coordinator for the government, have a citizen's app. And we were invited to give feedback on this app. We we're also invited for the official launch. It's really exciting that, you know, as a citizen, because, you know, now the world is talking about technology, artificial intelligence and real time information. Of course, it's countering fake news, misinformation and disinformation. So we've seen that proactiveness where her office has now launched an app where they've aggregated all what different ministries are meant to do and how much resources are going to them and what they're supposed to do on the ground, where the ministries have DEX officers that are supposed to give feedback and where citizens can actually give feedback report and get better service delivery so we're seeing that you know it's, it's still emerging yes it's been launched and people are now getting aware and people are using it we've also seen a stronger anti-corruption agency both icpc and efcc we've seen people who have experience who have capacity and who are willing to ensure that they're able to at least even uh, uh, jump in front of the corruption We've also seen the president appointing Malam Nuhuri Badu as his national security advisor. That was, you know, the pioneer chairman of EFCC. So it, it gives that feeler that, you know, the government wants to fight corruption. It gives that, uh, you know, that perception that, you know, the government wants to fight corruption. But again, the flip coin of it, the first biggest scandal was the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs that was caught in some web of over 500 million naira. Yes, the president was proactive to suspend her and investigate, but then they've gone mute. You see, the thing about fighting corruption is not sharing knowledge and information is tantamount to corruption because it, it sends a perception that you're not serious or that you're trying to shield your political, uh, you're trying to be, favor, you are trying to favor your well, political. There are conversations that she's not the only one who was doing that. Exactly. And what is the outcome of in the investigation? What is her fate? Are you reinstating her? Are you sacking her? Are we, you prosecuting her? Are you prosecuting her? Jail? You understand? Mm. So, so I think this has, the president has to put this on the table and give the Nigerian people adequate information in real time of his plans, his action taken, and what are the results. And nothing. Nothing yet. It's pretty disappointing. It is, but I'm optimistic. When you follow the money at the state levels, because you do, do you not? Oh, sub-national, yes. At sub-national levels. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you're seeing in that regard? Because oh. everyone keeps talking about, oh, look, they, they say they can't pay, but they are wasting money, or they are using money for other things. What are they using money for? You know, Kela, the biggest problem of Nigeria hmm, is a state. Our state governors are very powerful. They have immunity. And our state legislators, sadly, they're not empowered enough to be independent. They still rely on the executive. And that's why I like what President Tinibu is doing. The case is now in the Supreme Court. He wants to ensure that there's local government autonomy, because that's where the grassroots people are. And that's where they're supposed to enjoy and feel the dividends of democracy. At the state level, you write, free you write freedom of information letter. And they'll tell you, oh, this is a national law. It has not been domesticated. What does that mean? It means it has not been domesticated. But, but Kayla, we don't want it. But Kayla, exactly. <laughs> we, don't want, we don't recognize it. Yes. But you recognize fact allocation and fact sharing. You come to Abuja every last week of the month with your commissioner of finance and uh, state accountant general to collect fact. But yet, 
And what regulates fact is national law, but yet you don't recognize the freedom of information law. You, they keep saying, oh, we don't, we've not domesticated it, it's a national. And you know, they've been caught cases. Is follow the money unable to follow fact allocations? You see, we're keen about healthcare, education, mm -hmm. uh, resource governance, so oil and gas mining. So, because okay, like, we can't follow everything. We're not, we're not an agency of government. How much is our own resources or budgets that we, we use as oppression annually? So we only focus on issues that are targeted to the grassroots. If so you if could, if you could, would you follow FAC? Oh, yes. You will follow the allocations? We would find follow, the we will look at, and you see why I re really like the time where Madam Ungozo Nkonjo, well, I was a minister for finances, she published what every state gets. I think this administration is trying to also show that yes mo states are getting yeah, much more money that, yeah, because that of the removal month. of subsidy yes we saw you that know, increase we're that. hoping that we can mobilize and educate and organize citizens at the state level because the, the bulk of the work is actually at the state not at the national it's at the state how are state governors who has immunity and have executive power how are they distributing these resources to ensure fairness and equity that would be something to see. I want to see you follow FAC. You followed security votes. Oh, yes. I want to see you follow FAC. All right, well, let's move on to other things. Uh, insecurity in the North and calls. There are calls out there for timelines to be given to the heads of security agencies. So if you don't deliver, mm -hmm. you are held responsible mm -hmm. for it. There are people in the National Assembly who don't agree with this, but there are some lawmakers who do. So give them timelines. If they know that they will lose their jobs, they will sit up. What do you think? I agree. Eh? You know, you can't just... Neil, I have a board that holds me to account. I hold my management and staff to account. So if you get an appointment and there are no clear two hours, there are no clear timelines and deliverables, then you think that... Yeah, they'll give you a deliverable, but they won't give you a timeline. No, no, you yeah. have to get timeline. Oh, you must get timeline. And you see, President Tinubu said he was coming to office to deal with insecurity. It was part of his manifesto to consolidate and, you know, make more progress from President Buhari's government. And you have your service chief. And for, for once, we, we have an intelligent officer who was a police officer and who was, uh, you know, the pioneer chair of EFCC as his national security advisor. And he brought that, you know, wave of support and goodwill. And I think they need to leverage on it. You can't have service chief and not give them time. Okay, like I told you, I just came back from Brno State. While in Brno, and I was in Brno for a mission. So I, I sit on a board of an organization called uh, Center for Advocacy, Transparency and Accountability, Katai. So I, I chaired the board actually. So we went for a board retreat for a week. So we're holding the executive director accountable. So we went on the field to see beneficiaries of our humanitarian intervention. So we had to go to Goza. Now, Kela, to go to Goza, you can't go on by road. If you're going by road, you have to go with armed escorts. Armed, and uh, when I say armed, go to your car and you have a lot of RPGs and, and AKs, rifles, escorting you to, to Goza. To, but we use the chopper, so we use the humanitarian, um, the UN humanitarian uh, uh, helicopter. And you see, on my way to Goza and back, because it was a round trip, the roads and a lot of places were arid, they were deserted. Now in Goza, we have IDP camps and different settlements. Hmm? And I think this is where I would stop and commend the military, Nigerian Army, Navy, Air Force, and their joint effort and oppression in the Northeast. Because I interacted with uh, military personnel in the front line. It's not easy. These people have sacrificed and they're sacrificing to ensure that you and I can go to bed and co close our eyes. Because a lot of people say, it's a northern problem. No, mm. it's not a northern problem. See, you know, when it started in Bronu, and then we kept saying it was a Bronu problem. Then it escalated to Adamawa, to Yobi, even to Bauchi, and, uh, uh, you know? Yes, we know that the military have really tried and have pushed back this insurgent or this terrorist group, but there's still much more to be done. If you, know? you were, if, if, if you could give a timeline, let's say you came into power as president and, and you have service chiefs, 
if you were going to give them timelines, how, how long would those timelines be? Okay, as you give timelines, you also need to also give everything they need. Yes. You know the president they that have the tell biggest you, part of our budget. Everything yeah, security is security. Budget, yeah. Good. So what should the timeline be in your view? If I was president, 24 months, that's two years. Two years. If you are my security chiefs, chief of army staff, chief of naval staff, chief of air staff, uh, chief of defense staff, uh, chief of defense intelligence, mm. two years. You have two years to end this crisis so we can relocate people and rebuild our various communities. Mm. Two years. Oh, Would yes. you do reviews in between? Oh, yes. No, in between, there'll <laughs> be meetings. Because I feel like oh, we yes. don't want to sit no, no, down no. for two in between, years. There'll be, there'll, no, in between, there'll be meetings, you know, to check your yeah. key performance indicators. You also look at your budget. How are, are the bond rates? Are there gaps? How much resources do so you need? So two years to end insurgency. Oh, yes. Two Return years. people who are back displaced to their back to their communities. Yeah, rebuild communities, provide humanitarian intervention. Mm -hmm. And you see, Kayla, there's an imminent humanitarian crisis. Doctors Without Border had just released that there is malnourishment in some parts of the north. This is a national emergency. Mm -hmm. I was hoping that government would respond and react to this. But you don't have a Minister of Humanitarian Affairs because this is a humanitarian disaster. But you don't have someone leading the humanitarian ministry. Uh, you know, that's actually very interesting. Yes. We never really thought about it. We just felt, oh, this happened in the yeah. ministry. But who is leading, gap because who's I leading saw, humanitarian like efforts in, Goza, in the country I saw right the now? gap. You know, I saw the gap. And mostly you see INGOs and other partners who are, you know, trying to support. But you need government to coordinate. And it is the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs that would lead that charge. And we don't have that. So now there's an imminent crisis, malnutrition in the north, hospitals, MSF is crying out because they cannot alone do it. And there's no one to respond and act. You know, I want, not to take us back, but I want to go back to that labor situation. Remember when the, I remember you had, you were stuck in Burno. You had yeah, to, yeah. you were supposed to fly out and you couldn't. Um, there was one thing that labor unions did and many people are mixed on it. And that was the shutting down of the national grid. The Attorney General of the Federation says that's economic sabotage. They shouldn't have done that. As civil society, did they go too far by doing that? You see, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Leaving our national assets. Because the national grid is a national asset. And also have security implication when it goes off. It has security implication because there are places where when there are no light, people will die. And I'm not even talking about hospitals. There are, there are flashpoints and hotspots that when there's darkness, Cor because in crime darkness, just, crime yeah, happens. Crime becomes rife, yeah. Kayla, I remember, I want to share an experience. I remember um, that was in 2019 or 2020. I was in Strasbourg. I was invited by the Council of Europe uh, to speak in Strasbourg, that's in France. From Strasbourg, I took a train to Paris. When I got to Paris, I found out that they were on strike because I didn't get public. There was all the public transport facility were <laughs> shut down. So it was chaos, it was traffic. It was a nightmare. <laughs> exactly. But they did not shut down the national grid. They didn't cut power. But they did stop movements. They did stop movements. Yes. Which is an act of protest. Okay. You know, you know, blocking the road and trying to make... The, and they were unionists. They were trying to get government to also increase their minimum wage. Mm -hmm. That was what happened. It was a minimum wage issue. Yes, and it was a transport union. That, so that's why they stopped all the rail line. They, you know, they used their cars to block traffic. But nobody touched power because power is a national asset. And you sabotaging a national asset, is tantamount to some treasonable offense. You think the NLC committed treason by shutting down the national grid? Kayla, they went too far. Yes, they blocked the, the airport. That's a, that's a way to protest, that's fine. You blocked the road, they, they, you know, they were on the street, that's fine. But you shut down power, mind you, because also, the Nigerian government has privatized some, some part of power. So you're also infringing on the rights of investors who are controlling some aspects of the power supply chain. That's unfair. Well, let's call it spade a spade. I stand with 
level and I agree that we need to increase their minimum wage. But there are lines you don't cross and that's why I say you don't give absolute power to people because when you give people absolute power, absolute power leads to anarchy. It is one form of anarchy. Imagine someone who has powers to turn off our power and just feel or oh, because they are grieved or they feel marginalized and then they put it off. Put in over 200 million people in oil. Yes, we know that at least 40 to 50 million people are not connected. So over 100 million people in darkness. And these people are not the cause of the problem. It is government. How many percentage of our population are in government? Less than 2%. Why allow, why allow 100 million people suffer because of the actions? That's when negotiations coming from civil society, going. you know, no, most people so, from civil so, okay, society, they basically just support labor, you I, know, I but support, to, no, 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 I know I you do, labor. but to, but to state that they went too far Kayla, in shutting down the national Before grid. I became a civil society leader, I'm a citizen. Aren't we all citizens? Don't we have a form of patriotism in us? Even if our leaders are moving wrongly, do we move wrongly with them? What does that tell as Nigerians? So again, I think that even if you have absolute power, you must inform your decision by also looking at what are the implications to others. Kayla, I've led protests in Abuja. I've led, led, I've led rallies. I've never made it uncomfortable for other users. We always coordinate ourselves. When we did the Not Too Young to Run, we were always on the streets. You know? We've even blocked the gate of the National Assembly in protest. But we've also always have the voice, of, we heard the voice of reasoning, which is come and sit at the table and compromise and negotiate. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're saying. The government has to compromise. The labor union also has to compromise because we cannot remain stagnant. Speaking of civil society, um, I, was what, I was reading um, the write-up by Yaga uh, on the calls for the scrapping of SIEC, and they're basically saying, no, this is a bad move. But you see, over the years, the, the state INEC. Yeah, yeah, yeah the state independent, independent electoral yeah, commission. Yeah, state independent. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so over the, over the years, SIEC has got a bad rap because many people were like, this is... This is basically an arm of the governor. It, oh, yeah. It, it doesn't... Oh, really. yeah. So the calls for the scrapping of SIEC and ensuring that uh, elections at local levels are conducted by INEC for some civil society organizations, like I read Yaga Africa's um, pamphlet about it, was basically, look, this is, this is, you're overstretching INEC. Let's fix SIEC instead. Mm. But is it, is it possible to fix... An agency that, well, an office, it's, not, it, it's a mm. subsidiary of INEC, isn't it? But an, an office that the governor has so much power over. Yeah. Is it possible to limit his powers over the thing? And what do you make of the calls for the scrapping of SIEC? So you see, Kela, I've observed election not only in Nigeria, so I've observed election in Kenya, in Liberia, in the United States of America. So I'll use America as an example. So they have state electoral board. Yes. In short, I'm in touch with the one of the state electoral board, which is the SIEC we have in Nigeria. So every state electoral board conducts even their national election. They just forward the results to the tally center. And they're very independent and autonomous. And they're being regulated by the Senate, even in the state and the national Senate. So no interference. And you've not had any scandal where, you know, you know the electoral board is found wanting which is more like our own SIEC here. So when you look at it, Kayla, our state electoral board at the beck and call of the state governors, if we would scrap it and there are no interference, when, if INEC should conduct every election, but that would also be too much on INEC, knowing that they always, always struggle when they conduct the national ele election with logistics and even with technology. So, and that's very instructive, Hamza. It is. With a strong SIEC, you don't even need this uh, no, you federal don't. Exactly. business that Let we have Let every going state on. conduct election and just and forward it forward the to a switchboard. And, and we see the tally <laughs> and we, and we know it. who wins. So yeah. <laughs> I think... Ring if, the bell every hour telling us there's an update. <laughs> and you know, then we so check if, it. If we want to really strengthen institution, we should look at our sub-national. That's what I tell you. The problem is not national. It's at the state. So we need to, and what do they do? It's because the resources 
that is given to the state here, the governor has a role to play. So maybe we look at how we can fund our state electoral boards or our state independent electoral commissions, like we call them here, so that you know, no governor can interfere. Because in every election that they conduct, which is the local government election, whoever, is in, whoever party is the governor that is in office, all the local government, they will just announce results that ah, they've, they've, they, they, you know, the elections have been won. In most cases, man, there are no elections. You know? So for me, I'm, again, as a political scientist, I keep an open mind. I mean, we, we're, we are know? running out of time, but I want to get your thoughts from civil Because this um, impasse, I don't quite know what to make of it. And many, I'm sure there are many people like me who are wondering, what mm. is this about? We heard the former vice president and presidential yeah. candidate of the PDP say, look, there's subsidy, your subsidy is still being paid. Then we're hearing from the presidency, no, 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 there is nothing of the sort. Then we're seeing former spokespeople of the government saying, actually, it is being paid. Well, it was taken out, then it came back. They didn't tell us when it came back, and then prices of things are still the same. For, you, you, this is, you, you guys focus on this, right? So what, what's the story? Is there subsidy still being paid for fuel? Is fuel subsidy still being paid? Kela, this is my answer. The price of petroleum, pump price, is not supposed to be 630 naira. I don't know what magic government is doing to keep it at 630 naira. What does that mean? Government needs to come clean on what is actually happening. Because the price, in all fairness, Supposed to be over a thousand naira. So, in, so if, if subsidy was fully removed, the cost of petrol would be over a thousand naira. Is that what you're saying? So, for it to still be hovering between 630, 680 means something is going on that we don't understand. Is that what you're saying? To us? The president said subsidy is gone. Mm -hmm. You should explain what's going on. Mm. Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is so troubling. What's the worst case scenario? What's the worst thing that could be happening right now? Um, I think there's a conversation between the executive and the legislative arm, and they're doing something to keep it the way it is. But I think the government just needs to come clean and say, you know, this is what's happening. It will not harm anybody if, or hurt anybody if we know if they're trying to still support subsidy or subsidize petroleum pump price. Because... Yeah. I mean, that would be so strange. Well, uh, we are celebrating another Democracy Day. It's another day when we look back on Nigeria's democracy, on our politics, on our nation mm -hmm. status, if we do have one. What would be your word to the Nigerian people from civil society as they grapple with a, an economy that is threatening to kill them? Mm in the midst of a democracy that is being celebrated in many ways. So, so what, sh what should a Nigerian be thinking right now? Sacrifice. More sacrifice? Kayla. I don't have anything Kayla. else to give. We want... I'm, I don't have anything Kayla. else to give, Hamza. Kayla. <laughs> Kayla. We want a country where our children will be proud to call home. It takes a lot to build that country. All the countries I've visited in Europe, in the US, Southeast Asia, did, they didn't just wake up and became great. People put in effort and they did work. I think that we've come a time where we must work as one. Because what has been happening over the years is people work in silos, where people undermine others and each other, forming different blocks and groups trying to hold on to power. Kayla, as I grow older and evolve, I've understood that power is created. After you create power, you share it to ensure equity, fairness, and justice. And that's the tenant of democracy. So for me, my message to citizens is, we have to come together and work. We must stop the blame game. We must stop saying it is us versus them. Ah, I'm sorry. Nigeria is suffering. It is difficult for me not to blame people. Let me explain. I'm not. It's difficult for the Nigerian not to blame. Kayla. Look at look at the situation we have going on with state governors. 
the ones that have left office, Kaduna, Kogi, uh, Kano, we're seeing, in fact, the one that, is, that we're all facing right now is the probe that we're hearing is going to happen with the Kaduna State Governor, former Kaduna State Governor, mm -hmm. Nasser Erufai. We were still dealing with uh, Yahaya Bello and the amount of money that the EFCC said he, he took from Gov. And then we're seeing Ganduje and uh, the current um, Kano State Governor. With all of these things going on, it is difficult for the Nigerians to not blame them and say, you are destroying my country. You see, Kayla, I studied politics. Hmm? These are distraction. You see, these are keeping social media agog. And there's that tension, there's that debate. And people are becoming keyboard warriors. And they're focusing on what does not really matter. And that's why politicians can get away with what they're doing. I think we should not allow all of these distractors. As citizens, let us come together. A country where her people comes together always prosper. And for us to prosper, now is the time to stand the test of time and truly lead this country to greater height. Let us come together and create power. Let us share this power and ensure justice, fairness, and equity. I want to thank you so much, Hamza Lawa, for being with us on Political Paradigm. And good luck with following the money. Thank you, Kayla. We will continue to follow the money to make Nigeria proud. We have been speaking with Mr. Hamza Lawal, founder, connected development, activist, election observer, and accountability advocate. That's Political Paradigm this week. Remember, you can catch episodes of the program on YouTube via channelstv.com and keep the conversation going respectfully, of course. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Kayla Magua. See you next time.